All right. This is supposed to talk to you guys about seed production for the southeast and uh, kind of what we're doing uh, with the, I mean, the coastal plain too. Uh, good thing is I talk fast. I mean, I'll be able to understand me when I talk fast. We'll start out with a little bit of history lesson. Uh, basically, where I'm from, you know, what you would assume is native grasses, grasslands. Most people think of the uh, the western states, but Kentucky too at one time had a lot of uh, tall grass prairie between uh, five and six million acres at one time. So when we talk about natives, basically we're just saying the, the vegetation that was here pre-settlement before European influence. So before we came in and tore it up and messed it up, this is what we had. Uh, I won't stay on Kentucky, but I got hit on it anyway. What you're looking at right here is what was called the Big Barrens region. And at one time, that was totally grassland. No trees whatsoever. We've got uh, historical accounts and uh, diaries from several people that uh, uh, tell us what they saw, what was there. There was a gentleman named Francois Andre Michel. He was a Jesuit priest, and uh, he was just going through the countryside, spreading the good word. And not only was he passionate about the good Lord, he was also passionate about plants. And in one day, he described an area that he gathered over 30 species, or excuse me, 90 specimens in a single day. And he, put those in a book and he pressed them and they're still in a herbarium in France today. So we have a window as to what we had, what he saw. He described that area that he traveled in as 60 miles wide, 70 miles wide, long, and it was completely devoid of trees. And that was as late as the 1790s. And today, this is actually in the area that I live in. Some of the places he, he went were within six miles of my home. And it looks like Daniel Boone came through there in Old Oak Forest. He came back that fast after the Native Americans would learn. Just like in the Big Barrens region, we also had, it, here, it sits up here, it came on down into Tennessee and into the tip of Alabama. We also have the Black Belt Prairies, we've got the Piedmonts, Coastal Plain. So these are more just remnants of what we had at one time. And not only that, not only do we know those were large expanses, but uh, for instance, places like in the Daniel Boone National Forest, where it is old growth timber, where they've got 200 year old trees with power line companies go through and cut out. Within two years, they call me and we'll, have, we'll find 40, 50 different species of native grasses up in those mountains. Which brings us to the coastal plain. And, you know, I look at uh, how much diversity that we had in, in our prairies and our barrens and things like that. And this coastal plain is one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world, but with up to 90 species per square meter. And this is 90 million acres at one time. So what we don't have is a lot of plant materials that we need to keep this stuff uh, in the condition it was, or to, to recreate the prairies, savannas, and grasslands that we had at one time. Uh, this is a small area close to my home in Kentucky there. It's actually an old cemetery. It's never been plowed. Uh, I live in Hart County, Kentucky, on the south end of our county. It's, it's, it's real nice and rolling, very conducive to soybeans, corn production, and that's not where I live. I live at the northwest corner, which is north of the Green River, east of the tracks, and they consider me to be a trash farmer. Our ground's rough. The good thing about that is we have lots of remnants just like this. There's over 70 species in a quarter acre right here. Historically, I was a beef cow tobacco farmer. I had about 150 cows, 40,000 pounds of tobacco. I logged in the wintertime, and I was running my business very similar to a lot of non-governmental organizations, kind of a non-profit. So I was looking to diversify, and in doing so, my dad was on the board of the Nature Conservancy at the time. And we started getting a lot of conservation programs coming into Kentucky, CRP, CREP, and then we had all the acronyms for the wildlife programs, HIP, WIP, ZIP, BEEP, WIP. We've got all these programs that are going to utilize natives. And just because it's native doesn't mean it needs to go in the east. For instance, Big Blue Stem is native to 42 states, three Canadian provinces, and a big chunk of Mexico. You take a Canadian Big Blue and you put it in the deep south, it'll come up quickly, but it won't persist over a year. So even though it's the same plant, they do need to be in not, not specifically a genotype, but in a local region anyway, where they're going to do it. So me and my dad went out one day, uh, almost 20 years ago, with five gallon buckets, and we started hand stripping seed. And from that seed, we replanted it back in a field, we waited for it to grow, and within, it took almost five years to have commercially available seed from seed stock that we gathered initially. Uh, we were encouraged by the Nature Conservancy, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, to go do this initially. So we concentrated on Kentucky, and then we just kind of branched out from that as well. Uh, now we have over 250 different species of grasses, uh, wildfires, forbs, lagoons, wetland species, and we gather them from all over the, the southeast. 
part of what we do is, is we go out to a lot of bands, heritage preserves. Uh, we work with the Forest Service on a lot of places to get it off their properties as well. And just like we did in the beginning, we still get our start from hand picking. When we find what species we think we need to put in mixes, when we go out and we find wild lands, uh, we will take a botanical assessment of what's there, what ratio it is, uh, how many species in, a, in an acre. And when we do our custom mixes, we try and mimic what we find in nature as well. We go out and find individual species. For instance, we've got toothache grass, uh, round head lespedeza. This is a lopsided Indian grass. And me and my dad were the plant hunters. We're the ones who go out initially and we, we scout and we find them or we work with agents and folks to help guide us and put us in the right directions. Going from just seed takes a while. If we go to the plugs first, I can gain almost three years in production time. It's expensive to go to plugs, but it's very, very beneficial because I can take small amounts of seed. Uh, maybe I'll get a regional accession of, uh, say, Indian grass. I'll collect it from four states and maybe 10 different areas in each state. We will combine those genetics. That way we don't have genetic swamp. We don't have genotype seed that did really well where we got it, and when we move it around, it just dies. So we have good genetic diversity when we do this. Uh, I've got greenhouse production at my home. I can raise around 150,000 plugs there. Plus I have float beds where I do my wetland species on. And then the biggest part of what we raise is in uh, South Georgia. I don't have to have propane, so it makes it much more cost effective. We raise around 3 million plugs a year. Most of those go for sale, but the rest of them go into production. Where in South Georgia? Uh, around Moultrie. We've got, uh, when I say we have production, I, I've got over 40 producers. We call them producers, but we actually do all the work. So uh, in Kentucky and South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. Uh, here's us, uh, these are just some of the trays. I'm just going to show you pictures of kind of what we do and how we do. Uh, this is uh, one of the less pieces that we're getting ready to put into the ground. This one's just on a semi-trailer. That's just how we ship them to the field. If people buy plugs, then we can box them up. Uh, we do only 250 plugs at a time. Some of them are very small. Maybe are slow to grow, slow to establish. Primarily put on roots first. So a lot of these, you got to do by hand when we go to plug them in. Some we can do mechanically. Uh, and this particular machine, it actually pokes holes in this plastic mulch bed and drops the seed in there. So in this instance, we're just going from seed. Uh, we also use conventional methods. This is just like a vegetable setter or old-time tobacco setter. Here we are at the Georgia Forestry Commission. Uh, we work with it. Uh, we planted uh, around 25 acres of different species this last year. More shots. One good thing about George, we found out there's lots of masks. We all wear hair nets and face masks. This is a shot of muley grass right after it's been planted. And uh, a little over 15 different species this time we think we put out there. So we'll have lots of different rows. Uh, we provide this plant material and then they're helping us tend it and then they'll help us harvest it. A few more shots. And here's a uh, Irrigation, we do different types of irrigation, some of it's strip lines, some of it's open. Not only are natives great to work with and give you a good warm pleasant feeling, but they're also great for character building. This young man's wondering if the dirt bike's working. She's wondering why she ever married a farmer. And this little girl's teaching me patience. This is no-till production, where we go into erodible soils that we do not want to work up with the disc. So basically what we've done is we've made a tobacco setter with a shank on it that we can rip through the ground, we put herbicides down to take care of the vegetation, and it'll just make a small furrow in the ground. And we're putting, excuse me, a lot of water in at the same time to loosen that soil. Uh, then we have to come behind it and seal it if we don't get rains right away because they'll dry out very quickly. Uh, a few more shots of the uh, Flint River Nursery in Montezuma for laying plastic beds. Basically, this is similar to what uh, vegetable production is going on. There's a drip line that we lay out at the same time. It's underneath that plastic. A few more shots. Some of these are so small, we just have to poke holes with our fingers or sticks, and we put them in, and we have to bed them with our fingers. It's extremely tiny. So. <clears throat> Others where the plants are a little hardier than where he was using the uh, uh, plant. 
Here's some butterfly milkweed that we just got in the ground. You'll notice some is black plastic, some is white plastic. Some of them can't stand the heat from the black, and some of them need the heat to warm them up a little bit earlier. This is some great golden rod. It doesn't have plastic, it's just straight field production. Ball sunflower, that's from seed. Lopsided Indian grass. Once these grasses are established, a lot of times we'll run a, a fire through it. It may damage our plastic. Once they're established, it doesn't really matter. This is uh, slender Indian grass, Anacena golden rod. This is muley grass, the uh, first year right after planting. <clears throat> Most of the time, we do not get seed production first year. It's uh, at least the second year before we get started. This is a lowland cone flower, wet species. Uh, Frank's Edge, Maryland Senna, Deer Tongue Grass, Indian Grass Field. Some fields I have hundreds of acres of it, and some fields we only have maybe a quarter acre. I sell some things by the ground, and that's all we need. Big Blue Stem, <coughs> Black Eyed Susans, Little Blue. This is wild quinine in the front, uh, red headed coneflower behind it, and I think some more false sunflower to the left. <coughs> this is the lace grass that's in uh, just out of Tipton, Georgia, and it's on the right hand side of the slender less of these. On the left hand side is the yellow Indian grass, and all these are ecotypes in the southeast. Lace grass. Uh, this is a, a ascension possession of uh, an air leaf sunflower that came from South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. So all that's been mixed together with those genetics. But collected from the wild. Here's a piney woods drop seed, Florida tick to fall. These are just examples of species that we did with. There's, I'd like say, around 250 of them. This is butterfly milkweed. The reason I put this in here, there's a big difference in like the Indian grass field you saw. I can use large machines on it. With butterfly milkweed, we have to get up before daylight. We have to spray it to get the aphids off. Then I have to come back and spray it again with water, high pressure water, to take the herbicide off right on until the butterflies get on. Then, once it's ripe, we go through and we hand pick each pod every day that it's ready. So we've got about a three week window that we're picking pods every morning before we go to work. So that's one of the reasons there's so much difference in expense of some seeds and other seeds. Uh, nearly sunflower. The reason I put this up here is that once it's ready, the day it's ready, the finches will just consume it. They'll be on it. So we have to watch it every single day. It's not something that we can put off. Things that are indeterminate seeders, like the compass plant here, it'll have a, about a three week window that it's ready to go, so we'll go through every morning and pick only the pods that are ripe. Right. Seed it. Things like Illinois bundle flower. Once it gets ripe, the seed will hold in there for weeks. So it's a great one. It's easy. Therefore, we can be a little cheaper on price with it. John, yes, sir. Looking at how it is on the I've got one from West Virginia Plant Material Center, and I've got two from Kentucky, and uh, I've got uh, one from South Carolina. And we just keep those separate. I mean, all of our production fields, everything's a monoculture that we keep separate. One thing about picking with a five gallon bucket, you got plenty of time to figure out that there's got to be a better way. And I'm kind of into machines myself anyway, that's part of my damn fall. I have a weakness for them. Uh, started out, <clears throat> this was a prairie habitat seed stripper. It's very similar to the flail back. These are commercially available uh, out of Canada. I borrowed this one from our Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it was great. It really did be a bucket, but it, uh, it left about 50% of the seed in the field. Yes. Uh, right beside of it is an Alex Jones, all Prop 66. There's more of these combines commercially made than any other combine in history. I jacked that one up on stilts and painted it blue to match my tractor because I was getting fancy. This uh, stripper I made from scratch, and it did okay. It worked better with a double brush system. This is the next generation that I built. It'll go up to 11 feet in the air for, for tall species, or it'll go all the way to the ground and scrape the ground. Uh, a few more I, I made just improving on them as we win. I turned this one over where you can see the ball to the wells on the bottom side. <laughs> uh, we're harvesting needle and thread grass uh, in the, the Sand Hills, Nebraska. We ran over right at a thousand acres in 12 days with APB harvesters. 
these are homemade stripper combines with vacuum systems on them. We are harvesting um, wire grass primarily off England Air Force Base. So we go there every year to harvest. These things basically have a double brush, just like the other machines, but the vacuum system will suck back into a van. And this is what my guys affectionately refer to as a China vine. This is actually a rice harvester. It's great to have one guy with it on a trailer, and then we can stop off any little weapons and things, get through there very well. We're at a heritage preserve here in South Carolina. Uh, this is another rice harvester. It's on tracks, so I can actually do weapon species with it. This is a seed production field of wire grass that we put out for the club. Some things that have a pack of the wildflowers. It's too hard to combine so that because they're so fluffy, so we take them, we chop them, then I dry them out, and then I'm able to clean them and separate them from that. This is a great golden rod we're working on here. Uh, some things I can use conventional machinery on. Uh, I say that we pretty much gut these combines to make them do what we want to do. A lot of these species are so fluffy that they just don't want to run. Here we're harvesting in the sinkhole. This is uh, eastern gamma grass. And once it's ripe, you can only get a third of the seed at best. And basically, it's, uh, it's like putting silage through a combine. They're just not made from green material. And then we get on up to full size rotary machines as well for some of our bigger fields. And then when we get it in, sometimes it's nasty. That's uh, new and thread grass. And we've got to clean stuff up from that point. And then at the end, I've got uh, two different cleaning facilities. One runs 20 hours a day, eight months out of the year, and then the other one runs 10 hours a day, about the same amount of time. But, uh, my main line, I do my big fields, and then my lab model stuff, where we have all the wildflowers and small amounts. That takes a lot more time. Once we set the big one, we're good. Uh, I've got to have multiple people in there at all times. So I guess that's about all I've got time for. A bit. Yeah. I've got more ways to use it. Well, I'll tell you what, let's. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, we talked about seed, just really quickly. This is, uh, I can make seed slip. I can get everything out of this. This is the same pile. What's on the right here is regular any grass seed that's not been deviated. What's on the left has been deviated. The reason that I deviated is this. I know it doesn't look like much, but this is a beard, this is an arm. That is enough on the ground to hold that seed off of the soil. The seed has to have seed to soil contact. It's going to shoot out a little radical right here on the end of it, and it's going to try and hit dirt. If anything interferes with that, it's just exposed to dry air. So we want it to be as close to the seed, or as close to the ground as possible. So I can take that off, and I can make it slip forward. And then once I do that, you can do it through almost any conventional drill. Having said that, this is little bush then. And it's really mean. I can make it even slip. When I do that, I damage it. What you're looking at is a little bitty tiny chip at the end of that seed. And once I've done that, I've ruined it. That's why we don't get all of our seed completely slick. Some mixes you get from me, they may be slick before, but all the rest of them will still have some component. Therefore, you'll need a uh, native warm season grass tree, like Mr. Jim's true extra. Uh, it also helps keep them in suspension. It's not just to put them in the ground is also keeping them in a suspension in the mix. Any questions?